Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today our topic is Russia. We'll discuss that country's recent past as well as where it seems to be heading now. My guest today is Dr. Andrew Jinks. Dr. Jinks is a professor of Russian history. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thanks. It's great to be here. I want to start the conversation by referencing a quote by Winston Churchill that he made uh, in October of 1939 on the eve of uh, World War II. He was um, answering a specific question at that time about Russia and what would Russia do in the event, in the inevitable event, that Hitler was going to rampage across Western Europe. And his answer to that question was, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. But perhaps there is a key. The key is Russian national interest. And so that quote could be applied to almost any country. But uh, as time went on, that quote has, the first part of the quote has been extrapolated and used to sort of indicate that Russia is this very mysterious land with mysterious, unfathomable people. You've lived in Russia. Is there any truth to that? Are they any more unfathomable in Russia than anywhere else? No, I, I don't think that they are more unfathomable than people elsewhere. But it is convenient and to the advantage of Russians to convey an image of being mysterious. Uh, that gives them an advantage uh, geostrategically and when they confront other countries. I think the more apt metaphor might be the Russian nesting doll, the matroshka, where you have one doll inside of another. And so the whole idea is that you've got the big doll on the outside, but underneath there's something you don't quite expect. And you get all the way down to that smallest doll, and there you have the crux of it. In other words, it's not a mystery. You just have to keep on opening up those layers until you get to that thing inside. And I think this is the Winston Churchill's point. What's inside? National security interest. Okay, well, let's talk about the part of Russia that is rather mysterious to the American people, and that is the whole history of Russia and the fact that this vast landscape stretches from uh, Eastern Europe all the way to the Pacific Ocean, essentially. And even Alaska was part of Russia at one time before we purchased it from them as part of the so-called Seward's Folly. Uh, given this massive land, land uh, landscape, if you will, and the various groups that were uh, part of that landscape and even more so under the Soviet Union, what do we not fully understand today about the Russian uh, mentality and the, and, the Mush and the Russian psyche? Well, I think that the challenge of understanding any culture is that we are prisoners of our own perspective. And the United States is prisoner, I think, of a perspective which is informed by all sorts of geographical advantages. We have Mexico to the south, hardly a major uh, military threat. We have Canada to the north, some have referred to it jokingly as the 51st state. Then we have uh, the buffer zone of the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans on either side. So we are blessed with incredible security. If we uh, switch to the Eurasian context, that landmass that Russia occupies historically and today, they face a geostrategic and national security challenge that is unmatched around the world. Uh, if you look at all of their borders, they face security threats. And in addition to that, they have this vast landmass that is very sparsely populated. 90% of the population is focused in European Russia, and yet they have this huge landmass that has to be protected in Siberia, uh, which is virtually unpopulated. Uh, and so uh, combined with the history of invasion across this landmass, there's very little barrier to movement across this landmass, as the invasion of the Mongols suggested. Um, Russians have a kind of national security invasion psychosis. And so uppermost on the to-do list of any Russian government, whether it's Putin, whether it's in the Soviet period or whoever follows Putin, uh, will always be national security. Everything else on that to-do list is going to be below that. Growing the economy, creating freedoms and democracy. In fact, people will conclude and often have in Russia that if you want national security, you're going to have to give up some freedom. And in terms of that invasion history, we had, as you mentioned, the uh, Genghis Khan and the Mongol horde. We had Napoleon trying his hand at it in the early 1800s. And then, of course, Hitler tried it in World War II unsuccessfully. Uh, and the scar of World War II still exists in the Russian mindset. They lost something like, was it 30 million people? Yes, yes. Yes, and that's, uh, that's also critical to understand um, from, you know, I, I just recently read a, uh, a new biography of Brezhnev, wonderful biography. Uh, very interesting. It's called Man of Peace. Uh, 
And um, a lot of people would think, well, that's just propaganda. But Brezhnev was driven by his experiences during World War II, uh, fighting in that war and the horrible things that he saw to try to create a policy that would make Russia secure. And that's what drove him to detente with Nixon. And Nixon and Kissinger were able to understand and to recognize, this is rare for American leaders, the legitimate national security threats uh, that Russia faced. Um, and at least to assuage those fears somewhat. And Putin is driven similarly because in his background is the experience of the 900-day siege of Leningrad. He's from St. Petersburg, Leningrad during Soviet times. And so he is acutely aware when he, any policy that he engages in, uh, any encounter with other leaders is driven by a memory of the profound losses of World War II. That's something that we need to take into account. Uh, it, it left deep deep scars on the Russian psyche, and it will necessarily inform any policy that the Russian government engages in, whether it's Putin or anyone else. Let's talk about Vladimir Putin and who this man is. Uh, as you mentioned, he's from St. Petersburg. His mother was a factory worker. His father was a conscript in the Soviet Navy. So he came from a humble background. Uh, he, did ex he does understand about what happened in World War II there in, in his own city. Uh, but as he... Um, portrays himself today as the uh, spy master, the expert spy master. That's because of his 16 years in the KGB. Uh, what are we to make of his uh, promulgating this image of the expert spy master? Well, we have an image in the United States of, um, of Russian spy masters is very negative, and I think it's hard for us to understand that in the Russian context, uh, to be a spy is a heroic thing. And in the Soviet period, uh, the KGB and KVD earlier, that was an earlier iteration of the uh, Soviet spies, uh, the security officials, that they were responsible for protecting the revolution against its enemies, both externally and internally. They ran the border guards with their dogs, protecting the borders against all enemies, and of course, ferreting out the enemies from within. Putin, as the spy master, and he consciously develops this persona, uh, attaches himself to this comforting feeling of being secure because we have people who are watching our borders, they have our backs. So by Putin plugging into the image of being a spy master, he makes Russians feel much more secure and comfortable. And the interesting story about uh, Putin that I read was that uh, he was stationed in East Germany during this 16-year stint in the KGB and his his uh, major accomplishment, uh, apparently, was that he managed to bribe a U.S. Army sergeant to hand over an uh, unclassified uh, training manual for a few hundred dollars. And if that's the best he can do, I think the, the sergeant probably got the better end of the deal on that one. As far as uh, where we are today, of course, uh, he uh, did go into Crimea and uh, has annexed Crimea. We have problems in eastern Ukraine today, uh, all the blustering by Putin. What is this all about? Well, he's, he's first of all, there's a connection always to economics. Uh, follow the money, right? Uh, it's the economy stupid, as Bill Clinton used to say. And fundamentally, what's driving Putin's policies is the economy. And what I mean by that is the disastrous state of the Russian economy. The ruble is collapsing. The price of oil is plummeting on world markets. Russia depends upon that. Uh, the sanctions are beginning to uh, have a negative impact on the Russian economy. And so Putin has to be able to uh, bolster his image uh, and his popularity at home in a condition where standards of living are declining. And uh, gobbling up some territory and protecting Russians who exist outside of the protection of Russian borders is extremely popular and a very effective diversion, I think, away from uh, the economic problems. Uh, I don't know if you remember that movie back in the, I think it was the 1990s, Wag the Dog. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of the Wag the Dog scenario here. It's manufacturing a national security crisis and a war outside of your borders to protect um, your people, supposedly, in order to divert attention away from some sort of simmering domestic problem or scandal. In this case, in Russia's case, the disastrous state of the economy. And the economy in Russia today is largely dependent upon energy sales. That's oil and natural gas and coal and so forth. But it, the, the big uh, money is on the oil and natural gas. There's a pipeline that goes from Russia right through the heart of the Ukraine into Europe, supplying Europe with 30% of its natural gas. In Germany, it's 44% of their natural gas consumption comes from Russia. 
Um, so we we seem to have uh, now developed a situation of of uh, in the 70s it was mad mutually assured destruction. Now it's mutually assured dependency uh, because uh, Russia may threaten to turn off the spigot, but they can't really do that because they need the cash. Yeah, I'll have to remember that for my classes. Mutual assured dependencies. That's a great way I think of describing. Uh, the situation. Uh, we live in a globalized, integrated economy, and the Soviet Union itself was increasingly integrated into the global economy beginning in the late 60s and early 1970s. They wanted earlier under Stalin to create uh, an independent autarkic economy, but uh, by the 70s and 1980s uh, they were unable to do that, in large part because of their dependence on oil. So what the Soviet Union um, hopes, what hope, the Soviet Union hope, what Russia hopes now is that it can somehow extricate itself from these dependencies. It can't do that. Just as we, however, cannot extricate ourselves from mutual assured dependency. We will suffer along with Russia in trying to cut off economic contacts between the United States and Russia. And I think that this is the problem generally with sanctions. They don't work because they punish everyone. And by the way, they'll also make Putin much more popular at home because now he has someone to blame for his collapsing economy, the United States. And Putin of late has been uh, accumulating gold reserves. Uh, recently, in the, actually in the last year, his gold reserves have gone up by 25 percent. So he's spending a lot of that cash that he earns from the oil and gas revenues on, on gold reserves. Uh, in fact, in the last decade, they've tripled the amount of gold reserves that they have in Russia, and he's also doubled the uh, military budget over the last decade. So what do we make of all of these expenditures on the military and stockpiling and hoarding gold? This is all, I mean, John Fogarty, I think, had a song, of deja vu all over again with regard to the invasion of Iraq and connecting that back to Vietnam, but I'm having a feeling of deja vu here with regard to the 1970s. Uh, and the early 1980s. And what happened in the 1980s was, the early part of the 80s, the price of oil plummeted. Uh, and Russia had been able to uh, survive, to muddle through the Soviet Union in large part because it was using petrodollars to prop up the economy. Uh, and when the price of oil plummeted, this paved the way for the, as it turned out, disastrous reform efforts of Gorbachev, which turned out to be the coup de grace for the Soviet system. I see a kind of eerie parallel now with the plummeting of oil prices. This has put Russia and Putin into a very desperate position. In fact, his position is quite weak. That's what makes him so, I think, um, willing to take risk uh, in Ukraine is precisely because of the weakness of the Russian economy. We're going to have to take a yep. break right now. We'll finish this uh, when we come back. And when we do come back, we'll also talk about a recent quote by Mikhail Gorbachev that we may be entering another Cold War era. Stay with us. Who designs things like needle-free diabetes care, robotic checkups, and electronic aspirin? The answer, biomedical engineers. It is one of the most rapidly growing career fields in the United States. These people analyze and design solutions to problems in medicine and biology, improving the quality of patient care. With a degree from Cal State Long Beach, you can become a part of this amazing career field. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Dr. Andrew Jenks. Dr. Jenks is a professor of Russian history, and we're talking about Russia today. Andrew, before the break, uh, we were talking about uh, whether or not we're heading into another Cold War because of a quote that was uh, recently um, offered by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the former leader of the USSR, and he should know a little something about Cold Wars. So what do you think? Are we headed into that kind of era again at the moment? I. Uh, as an historian, I often see that uh, ideas about heading into eras become self-fulfilling prophecies. So the extent to which the historical actors begin thinking that there's a new Cold War will make them act in a way that makes that a self-fulfilling prophecy. And maybe in that sense, we're entering a new Cold War. But the future is always open-ended. Uh, it's not predetermined. So we can unthink uh, 
our position as currently being in a new Cold War, just as we can think ourselves into the position of being a new Cold War. But my biggest fear is that in imagining that we are engaged in some global conflict with Russia, or even regional in the context of Europe, and going back into those Cold War ideas, is that we're diverting attention away from the common enemies and common problems that uh, we have in common with Russia. And that is to say the problems in the Middle East uh, with ISIS, uh, with Islamic fundamentalism. I think it's much more convenient for both uh, Russia, in particular the United States, to slip back into that Cold War mentality, the good old bad old days of the Cold War, when it was clear who your enemy was and how you needed to contain them. We knew where we stood. We knew where we stood. Uh, it's proved to be extremely difficult to figure out how to wage this war against this nebulous thing called terrorism. God, it's much easier just to say that Putin is the problem and deal with the world problems in that context. Well, let's talk about what Putin's been doing uh, recently, most recently, and that is uh, sending his jets and long-range bombers into area that will, of course, cause interception by NATO jets and by American jets. He's talking now about doing regular flights with long-range bombers over the Caribbean and over the Gulf of Mexico. He's talking about going into the Western Atlantic and, of course, to the Pacific. And um, this will, of course, get a response from the Americans and from NATO in terms of these incursions. What about the posturing that goes on with uh, this kind of, of Cold War saber rattling, if you will? And how, how does the Russian game of chess versus the American game of poker enter into this debate? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting metaphor. I often in my classes talk about this metaphor that often Ameri the American national game is poker. Las Vegas, casinos, gambling, that's our passion. And the passion in the Russian cultural context is chess. But we see a kind of interesting uh, switch in the case of Putin, I think, where he's much more of a poker player than he is a chess player. And historically, poker players in Russia don't do well. Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, when he put his missiles in Cuba, was very much a gambler. He didn't have a long-term strategic objective. And every time his position domestically became more tenuous, he gambled that much more internationally. And I. I see Putin in that same context, that I don't think he has a larger geostrategic vision. He's simply trying to gamble that he can come up with some sort of foreign policy success that will bolster his position at home and divert attention away from the economy. The more that he lacks success in that regard, the more desperate he becomes as a gambler in the international arena. And I think that's the position that is driving the current the situation, the current crisis in Ukraine. And as far as Ukraine is concerned, we know that a, a Malaysian airliner was uh, shot down over the eastern Ukraine, a very tragic situation. What do we know about that? Any more than what we knew when it actually happened? No, we don't know anything more about it. Uh, it's going to be one of those, I, th I suspect, uh, my feeling is, is that uh, no one has an interest in actually revealing what happened to the extent that we have knowledge about what happened because there's lots of blame to go around on all sides. It's more convenient for this to remain ambiguous than all sides can try to make political hay out of it without actually indicating what just happened. Uh, so it's not, um, it seems to me it's, uh, it's going to remain a mystery that is politically useful to exploit on occasion, but there will be no clarity. It's like Lady Di and all the conspiracy theories with regard to JFK. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, it's convenient, I think, for a lot of people to see it as a mystery, and it will remain that way. Well, let's go back to the 1980s, because that was the last decade for the Soviet Union before the, its uh, imminent collapse. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union uh, invaded Afghanistan. The price of oil dropped because of the Iran-Iraq war, and that hurt Russia uh, tremendously because, again, their economy was based on oil and gas at that time. Um, and Ronald Reagan, as president, was referring to the Soviet Union as the quote-unquote evil empire. And uh, by the end of that decade, um, Russia was spent, um, the Soviet Union was spent, I should say, and that of course included Russia. Uh, what about the 1980s? Was that the decade that did the trick, or was the imminent collapse of the Soviet Union a long time in coming? No, I think it was, it was not uh, predestined. It's conceivable to me that the Soviet Union could have muddled through uh, very similar to the way that China managed to muddle through the disaster of its own attempts at uh, uh, at revolution under Mao. Uh, 
Uh, and then it, it maintained the sort of uh, the fiction of being a communist system, but it became, in fact, authoritarian capitalist, and we know how successful they were. I think that could have happened in the case of the Soviet Union. Uh, but it didn't happen, and it didn't happen for a number of specific reasons that are related precisely to what uh, you talked about. First of all, they lost real capital when the price, price of oil plummeted, uh, and they were unwilling to engage in the kind of economic reforms that Deng Xiaoping engaged in. He didn't care what color a cat was, so long as that cat could catch mice. Uh, and Gorbachev cared that the, the cat was at least a socialist cat. Uh, and so that was one of the problems. But the other problem has to do with Afghanistan. The authority of the system was based on the idea of the invincibility of the Red Army. Um, it, was a, it bolstered the authority of the entire system, just as Nicholas II at the end of the Tsarist era associated his authority with victory in war. So when there was a humiliating defeat in war, there was also the beginning of a collapse in political authority. So I think that the, the triggers were the price of oil dropping, the refusal to be more pragmatic about economic reform, to get, give up that socialist dream, uh, and then, of course, the eradication of the authority of the Red Army with the disaster of the invasion of Afghanistan. A lot of the time uh, when folks in America talk about the fall of the Soviet Union, they refer to the hmm. Ronald Reagan uh, expenditures on the military defense budget here and Star Wars as, uh, I guess, the final coup de grace to the Soviets because they couldn't match the spending at that time with what we were doing on military defense. What do you think of that theory? Oh, the old canard, right? Uh, that, that, that is, a, I think, a part of what uh, irritates me a, a bit about American perspectives is that we assume a kind of influence on world events that we lack. We exaggerate our impact. And that also makes us think that we can change outcomes around the world and interfere and meddle. The fact is that uh, the expenditures on uh, the military in response to Star Wars uh, were not a factor in any major way in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Absolutely not. There's not a single solid historical study that can make that case. All right, well, let's talk about what happened once the uh, Soviet Union did collapse. They ended up in an era of uh, basically kleptocracy. Yes. And how did they transition from where they were as a communist country with a communist socialist society and economy to um, one of a kleptocracy? Oh, yes, that's a very interesting story. Uh, initiated by Boris Yeltsin, uh, in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, takes over, feeds off of the carcass of the Soviet Union. Uh, basically, Boris Yeltsin got together with the heads of the other constituent, nominally national republics of the Soviet Union, and he said, okay, we are all communists. We will convert ourselves into the George Washingtons of our new nations overnight, like rats leaving a sinking ship. That ship is the Soviet Union. Uh, and we will escape uh, the consequences of the collapse of the communist system. And in the process, we will loot that public asset, which was the entire economy of the communist system, and privatize it in our hands. Um, and so what the collapse of the Soviet Union produced uh, was uh, the most incredibly rich people you could possibly imagine, almost all of whom were former communist or security officials, KGB officials. Uh, and so if you kind of think long term, Putin represents the interest of those rats leaving the sinking ship uh, who transform themselves overnight into some of the wealthiest people on earth. And um, his goal, if he really has a firm goal, is to protect the interest of those filthy rich people. So long as they continue to support him, he will allow them to keep their ill-gotten gains. Um, and this is true in Ukraine. It's true in Russia, it's true in Uzbekistan, it's true in Kazakhstan, all those former Soviet republics. I think we can classify them most accurately as kleptocracies. Well, when I read about this at the time, there were a lot of references, a lot of references to the Old West. It was yes. sort of the Old West gunslinger, every yes, man for himself, kind of. And, and you were there, actually, during part of that period. Yes. Was that your impression as well? Oh, yes. Anything goes. Uh, it's a... Uh, Wild West capitalism, but combined with a, a sort of a, a particular element that was unique to Russia. Russians were raised, Soviets were raised during the Soviet Union like mother's milk on the idea that capitalism is evil, exploitative, it has no redeeming qualities. So I think that when Russia's entered it, Russians entered into that capitalist phase in the 1990s, uh, they had an image of capitalism which they tried to enact, which was based precisely on the image that they received in their education, the propaganda of the Soviet Union. So they've created a system in which capitalism is totally corrupt, 
uh, crony capitalism, kleptocracy, it has no redeeming values. Uh, these capitalists, unlike Leland Stanford and the rest of the robber barons, are not giving back by creating new institutions of higher learning, by giving to charities a la Bill Gates. They lack this kind of conscience, and I think it comes from a particular way of understanding capitalism. It's a legacy of the Soviet system and its propaganda. So basically their propaganda led to a, pro a prophecy fulfilled, I yes. guess, in a sense. We just have a moment left, yeah. uh, about a minute or so. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the space race and how the, the Russians actually won the space race, the first two rounds with Sputnik and then Yuri Gagarin going into orbit. Uh, and then now we've been into an era of cooperation actually with the uh, Russians. Uh, we actually need the Soyuz uh, program to get our own astronauts up to the space station, although we're working with Boeing and others to try to resolve that. What about the space race? Is that an area where cooperation can uh, be maintained? It's one of the few areas where cooperation has to be maintained. There's no way that uh, you can conduct a Cold War in space uh, if Russians and Americans and Europeans are all on that space station. They're extremely vulnerable. Uh, they can ill afford to start uh, yelling at each other uh, and uh, slinging accusations at each other. And so it's curious that uh, I've spent a lot of time at NASA last year doing research on the history of collaboration in space. And the space station is a kind of uh, it's, it's one of the few areas now uh, where the cooperation uh, is, the, is the emphasis. And I think it can be potentially at least what we're doing in cooperating with the Russians, a model for how we need to cooperate in other areas as well. And by the way, this was a vision that Richard Nixon had along with Henry Kissinger. 1972, he signed a broad ranging agreement with uh, Leonid Brezhnev in order to collaborate in space. The byproduct, oh, go ahead. Uh, actually, we're gonna have to end on that okay, note. All right. But it is a positive note. And with that, thank you for joining us on Talking Points today. Join us again for another episode soon. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.